Next part to be discussed is lactation. Lactation ensures that the neonatal mammal does not have to obtain food on its own. The neonate benefits from this synthetic and secretory process because its only behavioral requirement in the early postnatal period is suckling the dam. Some animals have been domesticated and selected so they produce quantities of milk that far exceed that needed to nourish the young. The dairy cow is the dominant producer of milk for human consumption. However, goats, sheep, water buffalo, camels, and mares are also considered important for their milk-producing ability in some parts of the world. The immense milk-producing ability of the modern dairy cow has provided a huge variety of dairy products that contribute to a multi-billion dollar industry in the Western world. In this light, much of the information provided in this section will be about the dairy cow. However, the basic principles apply to most mammals. The development of the mammary gland or the mammogenesis, anatomical diversity, and milk ejection from the gland will be the priority topics in the remainder of this chapter. Mammary glands are sophisticated sweat glands. Mammary glands arise in the developing embryo along two lateral lines on the ventral surface of the developing conceptus. These lines are slightly thickened ridges of epidermis and are called mammary ridges. The mammary ridges extend from the axillary region of the conceptus to the inguinal region. The number of mammary glands that develop from the mammary ridges depends on the species. For example, animals like the pig, dog, and cat have a series of individual glands that develop at predictable positions along the entire path of the mammary ridges. In contrast, animals like the human and elephant have paired mammary glands that develop from the thoracic portion of the mammary ridges. Animals like cow, mare, and goat have mammary glands that develop from the inguinal region of the mammary ridge. The thickened epidermal epithelium creating the mammary ridges gives rise to the primary mammary bud. The primary mammary bud pushes into the underlying dermis as it grows. Continued growth results in secondary mammary buds that form bud protrusions away from the primary bud. These secondary buds then lengthen and branch throughout the remainder of embryonic development. Finally, these branch buds begin to canalize, forming tiny ducts in the center of each bud. Each bud then becomes a duct with a lumen. At birth, the mammary glands consist of olfactiferous ducts that open into larger ducts and empty to the exterior of the mammary gland through a teeth or nipple. Postnatal growth of the mammary gland is endocrine mediated. Complete anatomical development of the mammary gland, coupled with the ability to synthesize and secrete milk, does not occur until the female has reached puberty, becomes pregnant, and gives birth to offspring. Between birth and puberty, mammary growth is isometric. Between birth and puberty, the mammary gland experiences isometric growth. In other words, there is no noticeable enlargement of the mammary glands when compared to the rest of the body. Mammary glands grow significantly between puberty and pregnancy. After the onset of puberty, the mammary gland begins to grow at a rate that is disproportionately faster than normal body growth. This type of growth is referred to as allometric growth. During repeated estro cycles, a duct and alveolar framework is constructed within the mammary gland. This framework provides the cellular basis for future milk synthesis. During the first several estro cycles, the ducts begin to branch and their diameter increases under the influence of estradiol. Under the influence of progesterone, the terminal portions of each branch 
begin to form the initial portions of the alveoli. The alveoli form the functional secretory elements of the mammary gland. Estradiol alone will cause some duct development, but more complete and rapid duct development occurs in the presence of prolactin and the growth hormone somatotropin. Both of these hormones increase during the onset of puberty. Repeated cyclic exposure of the mammary cells to estrogen and progesterone can stimulate mammogenesis to proceed only so far. Final mammary development occurs during pregnancy. Complete alveolar development in the dam takes place during the last trimester of pregnancy. During this time, the terminal alveoli begin to grow into bunches called lobules. During the final trimester of pregnancy, the lobuloalveolar structures develop to the point where they represent nearly 90% of the cellular mass of the mammary gland at parturition. Prolactin, adrenal cortical hormones, and placental lactogen are important in allowing the mammary epithelium to synthesize milk. The induction of parturition is carefully timed with the onset of the mammary gland's ability to secrete copious quantities of milk so that the neonate has immediate access to milk. This is a continuation on chapter 15, specifically on lactation. Lactation provides immune protection and nutrition for the neonate. We have colostrum, which is the first milk produced after parturition and which contains immunoglobulins. It is also important for neonatal survival because it contains IgA, which help protect the newborn against diseases and for the development of its immunity. Colostrum is provided for only a short span of time, specifically 2-3 to three days. In ruminants, horses, and pigs, we have the so-called epithelial placenta, where immunoglobulins cannot be transferred in utero, so there is a need for ingestion of colostrum after birth. In humans, hemochorial placentation, where there is a placental transfer of immunoglobulins from dam to fetus. Thus, the baby is born with partial passive immunity. Here are some advantages of breastfeeding. Breastfed calves have fewer ear infections, they have fewer respiratory infections, and have higher growth rates. In women or them, there is low risk of breast cancer. During the course of lactation, milk synthesis increase and then decrease after the secretory peak. Animals like goat, sheep, and horse only have two teats, so nutrition of the neonates could be compromised if she gives birth to quadruplets or triplets. So next we have involution, which is the return to a non-secretory state. As defined, involution is the shrinkage or return of an organ to its normal size, for example, of the uterus after childbirth or of mammary gland after lactation. As the neonates suckle less, there will be a buildup of pressure in the mammary gland. We have what is called the pressure atrophy. Secretory cells remain non-functional until the following pregnancy. To put it simply, in mammary involution, the mammary gland transitions from its lactating state to a non-lactating state. Next, here is a figure of the changes in tissue mass of the mammary gland. So the mammary gland undergoes continuous change from prenatal, um, puberty, pregnancy, and lactation. So during pubertal onset, the secretory tissue of the mammary gland increases. During the first pregnancy, the secretory tissue will continue to increase at a faster rate. During parturition, the secretory tissue mass continues to increase until it peaks shortly during the first lactation. So at the end of the first lactation, we have the mammary involution or INV, where the secretory tissue mass decreases significantly. The secretory tissue and the ductal tissue will again increase during the second pregnancy and lactation and is followed by the second involution. 
Milk contains hormones and growth factors. So, substances in blood like hormones and growth factors can be found in milk. Protein hormones like prolactin, gonadotropin releasing hormone, growth hormone somatotropin, and thyroid hormone thyroxine. Also, there are steroid hormones like estrogen and progesterone found in milk. Alcohols, antibiotics, and drugs can be found in milk if consumed by the dam. So there are physiologically active peptides which are derived from milk proteins like casein and lactalbumin. So these peptides control blood pressure, prevent blood clots, and activate the immune system. Casomorphines, an opioid peptide derived from casein, inhibit gut motility and produce analgesic effects. So for those cheese lovers out there, did you know that cheese contains casein? It also contains casein fragments called casomorphines. So these casomorphines are morphine-like compound that when consumed, they attach to the same brain receptors that heroin and other narcotics is attached to is probably why you keep on craving for more. Moving on, we have milk injection, which is an active reflex of sensory neurons in the teeth and results to the transfer of milk from alveoli to the mammary duct, specifically the cistern. It is also referred to as milk letdown. The timely removal of milk is important for neonates. It's also important for the prevention of pressure atrophy and it can contribute to greater quality of milk being secreted. So between suckling, 70% to 80% of all the milk secreted is located within the lumina of the alveoli and small ducts of the mammary gland. So such a large quantity of milk needs an active system for its removal and a way for the neonates to have access to it. Milk ejection requires sensory activation, neural activation of hypothalamus, oxytocin release into the blood, contraction of myoepithelial cells, and mechanical transfer of milk from alveoli into ducts, and finally into the teeth or nipple. There you have a figure of the anatomy and physiology of milk ejection. So let's start with number one. Milk ejection is generally initiated by suckling. So when the neonate suckles on the teeth, its sensory neurons and impulse cells will be sent to the hypothalamus via afferent nerves, as shown in number 2. Oxytocin will then be released by the posterior lobe or the neurohypothesis. Oxytocin will then circulate through the blood and target the myoepithelial cells. The myoepithelial cells will then contract reducing or squeezing out milk from the alveolus and into the larger ducts. So simultaneous contraction of these cells will help deliver the milk to the cistern where it is accessible to the neonate. This slide is a summary of what I have discussed earlier. So it starts with the tactile stimulation, which is a driver for milk injection. Also, visual and auditory for the sight of the newborn which can stimulate the release of oxytocin from neurohypothesis, posterior lobe of pituitary gland found at the base of brain. Then oxytocin secreted into blood and circulates in the body, which makes the myoepithelial cells contract, thus reducing the diameter of alveolus. Milk is then ejected into the larger ducts and then into the nipple or teeth. Well, that's the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.